Now for today's program. Richard Michelson's poetry collections include More Money Than God, Battles and Lullabies, and Tap Dancing for the Relatives. He wrote the libretto for the off-Broadway musical theater piece Dear Edvard, and his children's books have been on the top 10 lists of the New York Times, Publishers Weekly, and The New Yorker, and Richard has received a National Jewish Book Award. His latest book of poems is Sleeping As Fast As I Can. Richard is the owner of R. Michelson Galleries in Northampton, Massachusetts. Amy E. Schwartz is Moment Magazine's opinion and book editor, as well as editor of the magazine's popular Ask the Rabbi section. Before coming to Moment, Amy was a longtime editorial writer and op-ed columnist at the Washington Post, where she was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize in commentary. Amy is president of the Non-Denominational Jewish Study Center in Washington, D.C., and is the editor of the book, Can Robots Be Jewish? and Other Pressing Questions of Modern Life. Please welcome Richard Michelson and Amy E. Schwartz. Thank you so much. Welcome, everybody. And Rich, thank you so much for joining us to talk about your wonderful work, which- Well, uh, it's an absolute pleasure, and thank you for inviting me. Preparing for this talk has really been a joy because I've been able to read this book through several times and, and think about it deeply. Um, let's start with a big question about poetry, if you don't mind. <laughs> All right. Um, how about, how about little tiny steps first? No, no, go, go for it. <laughs> um, so you, you write about a lot of big public subjects in your poetry. You write about bigotry and hatred, uh, the death of George Floyd, the Tree of Life massacre, the pandemic. Um, doesn't the book and, sound fun already? Okay. Doesn't it, right? I mean, no, no, no. and I mean, but when also many other more traditional poetic subjects like your parents and memory. Um, and I'm just, I want to tee this up. Many, many years ago, I, I was lucky enough to interview the great Margaret Atwood, who writes both poetry and novels. And mm -hmm. I asked her about the difference. And she said something that stuck with me, but obviously it's only one interpretation. She said, for her, Poetry was kind of the leading edge of the language where it regenerated itself and, and became something new. And whereas where language, the novel was where language for her intersected with society. So um, I'm going to. I'm going to start off by saying, not to put you on the spot, but I, I, I see that your view is different about this because your poems are very much about society in, in addition to being about language. So um, tell us why write poetry? Like, what can you say in poetry that you can't say any other way? Um, well, I mean, for me, poetry is form, foremost about language. Uh, I absolutely am in love with language. My poems generally start with a phrase or a word. Uh, they don't start with a subject. Uh, be, you know, I'm often, most people know me, many people know me, if they do know me for my children's books, uh, which, um, you know, I also write a lot of, about a lot of social justice issues and race in that. Uh, and a question I often get is, you know, uh, how is your poetry different than your children's books? And I think that it's appropriate to answer this question. Uh, when I'm writing a uh, for children, I pretty much know where I'm going to end up. I have a subject, and then it's up for, to me to find the words to bring that subject to life. I approach poetry very differently, frankly. Um, it starts with a phrase or something I hear or a word that just uh, comes to me and seems to marry another word. Uh, and then I just start writing. Uh, but because I am you know, a political animal, I mean, I think that uh, much of my day is uh, spent thinking about politics and my place in the world and while our place, all of us in the world, the subject always comes up. And then I am using the words to express that, but I never quite know where I'm going to end up. And that's the difference between, um, you know, for me, between poetry and prose. When I'm writing prose, I have a pretty good idea. You know, other novelists, of course, might be different. They inhabit their characters and they follow them. Uh, when I'm writing prose, 
I usually have a subject and a theme in mind. Uh, when I'm writing poetry, I have words in mind, and then the themes sneak their way in. So organically, so in this, so the themes in this book, they th there are so many different themes, but that's interesting because they do seem to intertwine organically until you feel you're you're experiencing all these different themes at once, which is well, this. this this book was written over the last say six years, um, and. We have all experienced something, at least in my life, that I never expected to experience again. Um, I have always been very cognizant of, about anti-Semitism. Um, I've always tried to call it out when I see it. Sometimes I see it where it doesn't even exist because I'm so attuned to that. Um, and, uh, and through all that, I really, however... Uh, understand now what I didn't understand then is I really thought we were past a certain type of anti-Semitism um, that seems to have exploded along with certainly a race, uh, you know, a new round of racism. Uh, so all that was going on. I mean, this is not a political show, obviously. My viewpoints are my viewpoints, I'm not moments viewpoints, although I think we might share a few. Um, yeah, you're describing an experience a lot of us have been having lately about yeah, being astonished uh, at this uprise of, yeah. And, and we're so steeped in that, that I've, then that comes out into um, my work. Uh, another thing, obviously, that uh, having read the book that you see throughout is there's a lot in the book about uh, gun violence. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad was a victim of uh, gun violence or racial. We were the only Jews left in a neighborhood that started out Jewish and ended up black and then went to uh, Latina, uh, Latinx uh, after that. So race has always been a very important part of my um, upbringing. I mean, it's hard to say growing up, I was one of the very few white children in my school. Uh, you know, and this stays with you. I'm here, as are you right now in Martha's Vineyard in Oak Bluffs, uh, where every morning I swim with the polar bears, which is a large group of black, uh, mostly black women, um, but also uh, a few others of us. Uh, and it's just, uh, it's a wonderful environment, but it's not society at large right now. And so all these things, I've been fighting for gun control uh, for 50 years now, a battle I am sorely losing, unfortunately. Um, things have only gotten worse. So all that came about while I was writing this book. Um, by the same time, um, my mother was uh, declining and experiencing uh, dementia. Uh, and uh, and she since passed. So it was kind of a dark time for me, probably darker than some of my other books. That said, not to scare off your audience or anyone, I think the book is funny um, because that's how I survive. Uh, and it's how Jews have survived for millennia. We find the humor uh, in things. Right. So, so um. So as they say in another genre, let's go to the videotape. I, I, I always have this <laughs> fantasy about how, say, a poet says to a child, you know, there are some things that can only be said in poetry. And the child says, oh, what are they? You know, so you have to, at some point, right. you have to actually hear the poem for these things to um, uh, to, to understand what we're talking about. So right. we, we and, talked about- fact, Robert Frost, you know, famously said when somebody asked him to explain one of his poems, he said, so basically what you want is for me to say the same thing I've already said, but say it worse. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. So um, so I uh, we we agreed that a nice place to start for people to um, uh, get a sense of the, an entry point to this book would be your poem Neighborhood Villanelle. And I'll I'll just say first not to not to ruin it or tee it up too much, but that this is a poem on a fairly traditional topic. This is partly about your relationship with your father, um, and it's also in a very clever and demanding form. It's a villanelle, so there are um, repeated lines, and uh, maybe you want to 
say something about the rhyme scheme before you start, or maybe you just want to jump in. Sure. Well, I think um, the villanelle that probably most people are familiar with, if you're familiar with the villanelle, is Dylan Thomas's Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. Um, what happens, it's uh, three lines, following three lines, et cetera, et cetera. The last line in each stanza repeats in the following stanza, uh, in the last stanza, uh, both la the last lines come in. Uh, I can get technical, but you will hear a certain uh, theme. And again, this, uh, what we have gone through in the last years, the uh, death of George Floyd, many uh, Black and Latino children uh, being killed, has brought up my own background uh, and my own neighborhood. And so that starts coming back to me later in life. And this is called Neighborhood Villanelle. In this neighborhood, you'd better learn to fight, my father says. Real schoolings from hard knocks, books won't save your life. He knows I'd rather write and read. I don't talk back. His love is no birthright. Instead, I bluff, act tough. He teaches me to box. In this neighborhood, you'd better learn to fight, he says, or you'll be prey. Better tough Israelite than studious black hat, defenseless orthodox. Books won't save your life. I know you'd rather write. Next day was Hanukkah, the festival of lights. Hey, Jew boy, some kids jeered as if I wore earlocks. I was no Maccabee. Bluff called. I could not fight. I came too battered, bruised, but had no appetite for bloodshed or revenge. Instead, I walked for blocks, prayed books would save my life. I swore someday I'd write these lines, and now I have. We never kissed goodnight, yet every poem I wrote, he saved. The paradox, a bullet stopped his life. Lead plug, he could not fight. I escape the neighborhood with every word I write. That's, that's a very beautiful um, resonant poem. And Thank you so much. And behind me at the tabernacle where I am, I'm in the, uh, um, somebody just finished and there was applause at the exact right time. So um, yeah. it uh, it worked out nicely there. Oh, that's great. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, there are a couple of things to, I will, I, I want to say about that poem for the, uh, for the listeners. Um, although the main thing is just they should go out and get the book so that they can read this poem again and appreciate the, the visual aspects of it. Um, but first of all, I think you're, you're writing in a very um, uh, venerable tradition there, this, this uh, story of the father and the son, and particularly the son who, um, who becomes the writer and that, and, you know, fulfills his dreams that way. It, it does kind of remind me of the, the, the famous, it's in the tradition of that famous Seamus Heaney poem about his father, I think it's called Dig, where he, he talks about his father troweling the ground. And, and then at the end, he, he looks at it, the pen in his hand and he says, I'll dig with that, mm. I'll dig with this. A beautiful um, poem is. A beautiful poem. Um, so, uh, do you want to talk more about the influences on you, whether about whether formal or, you know, or sort of more about your parents and your background? Um, I did not grow up, I, you know, in a literary background. Um, my father, I don't believe I ever saw her read a book. Um, and uh, um, and I as my mother, however, my mother did read. Um, she, you know, tended to read what the bestseller list, etc. Um, but uh, uh, they grew up poor. They were next door neighbors in East New York, um, and uh, where I was born and grew up. Uh, and certainly, my dad had a hardware store. Um, he was a uh, victim of a robbery uh, and uh, shot. Um, uh, my mom. Uh, How old were I, you when your when your dad was shot? Um, I was uh, in my young twenties. Mm, okay, go on. Sorry. Uh, 
Yeah. Um, my mom and I were very, very close. Um, and she was certainly very proud of my work. Um, I never, you know, my, my dad never quite understood that. Yet after he died, um, we did find little copies of, you know, my poems in his desk drawer, in, I mean, in his drawer at the, uh, where he worked at the uh, uh, hardware store. Uh, and I do write a lot about, you know, about him, uh, about our relationship through life. Um, I came to poetry much later and uh, and then it took over my life. Uh, and uh, I absolutely feel it is a medium that is suited for today. I mean, we have short attention spans. Uh, you can read poems uh, and then think about them. Uh, and uh, and also, you know, I'm sometimes asked, uh, um, is it difficult to write such personal poems about your family? Um, and for me, in fact, it's almost the opposite. It's not that when I'm writing about is like the only time I'm not thinking about, um, you know, my mom's death or dementia, my dad's uh, murder, um, what's going on in the world. What I'm thinking about is the next word and why it's not coming. And in a sense, the writing of that is my relief from, uh, you know, from the uh, subject matter in a sense. Yeah. And do you do you find readers, do you get that back from readers too? I think for a lot of readers to see something really captured in words in a surprising way can can be a great relief of pain. It's amazing to me that, uh, you know, it's a very difficult subject. I mean, you can read a poem or I can uh, on, say, mass murder or someone's or the Holocaust or someone's uh, a death in somebody's family. And yet it brings you a great sense of love or satisfaction um, by reading that poem. Uh, you know, it's why we can continue to, I mean, you could read Elie Wiesel with, you know, I mean, certainly uh, you read Night, it's depressing, but there's also something about it that's hopeful. Uh, and it's in the language. And I think just by virtue of writing itself, uh, you know, uh, there's the old joke, what's the difference between a Jewish uh, optimist and a Jewish pessimist? A Jewish pessimist says things can't get any worse. And a Jewish optimist says, yes, they can. Well, um, the uh, by reading about that, it gives you a feeling of, of you know completeness uh, and also it's a hopeful sign we would not put words on paper if we didn't if we weren't an optimist that life will continue it will go on I mean in the camps people were writing poems and doing paintings that is truly the most optimistic vision of life you can have yeah that's remarkable really so that's actually a good segue to um, a question I was going to ask. So much of your work is about memory. You know, we've talked about that a little bit uh, already. You've alluded to that already. Um, do you feel as if you're working in a, a particularly Jewish tradition there? I mean, is memory unusually fraught for Jews or unusually central or, you know, well, you, I, is I, that I, how you experience it? Yeah, I mean, certainly. Uh, as Jews in general, we are brought up with, you know, um, uh, never forget, um, certainly in my generation. Uh, and our books are all about memory and going back and tradition, et cetera, et cetera. It's a literary tradition. It's a cultural tradition. It's a religious tradition. I mean, we're still celebrating uh, and mourning things that happened 3,000 years ago. Uh, so is it uniquely Jewish? Uh, I don't know that it's anything is uniquely anything, frankly, um, but we certainly have a track on that. And it certainly shows up in my work, um, which tends to be political and very based very much on what is going on today, but also brings in the hist I can't write about today without writing about 
the history of Jews. I just can't do it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, it always comes up. There's always, um, well, I'll, here, I'll read something. Uh, I know you should, I don't want to take over here. Um, no, please. I was um, just going to say, time for another poem. <laughs> so, so let's let's read this. I wasn't necessarily going to read, but I'm going to read it because I think it's very uh, pertinent to what you just said. Uh, this is a poem called Poisoning the Well. Uh, yes. uh, and it is written in couplets. Uh, those are two line stanzas that rhyme um, at the end. And this poem was, uh, I, I think, was is very current is current as uh, a couple of weeks ago when Robert Kennedy, who's running for president, um, mentioned that the uh, coronavirus was engineered to avoid attacking Jews and uh, Asians. Mm -hmm. uh, a patently racist um, statement uh, and uh, and yet also a historical statement. Uh, it goes back to, uh, and he, he said that well after this, I mean, this book was published, um, but this goes back to the Black Plague when Jews were accused of engineering the Black Plague because their, Jews tended not to be as affected by the plague at the beginning. Uh, and again, there were real reasons for this. One is because Jews were walled off from the rest of the population. So you didn't have that same back and forth of bringing things in. Another thing is Jews were unique in that they cleaned their houses once a year um, when they were cashering for Passover. Uh, so if a plague was coming in around that time, it would get a little uh, better. But um, but this poem, Poisoning the Well, is about that history that comes up to today in the most recent uh, virus. And I'll read that quickly. This is called Poisoning the Well. Hold on. And I will just say, hold on to your hats, guys, because this one's quite quite tough. It was 1348 when the Tulan Jews were first accused of poisoning wells, my grandfather says. I've refused at eight to wash my hands before dinner. And so a story about purity, the bubonic plague, and God's glory is proper punishment. Though then, as now, persecution and rotting cadavers seem to be meager confirmation of heavenly endorsements. When brutalized, some reach toward religion. Others might apostatize or research their inner demons. My grandfather abandoned all trivial delights for Talmudic law, bathing corpses before burial, purging the house of chametz and cashering the oven each Pesach, while I, feather in hand, dusted for leaven. The city's Jews segregated in a walled-off ghetto, escaped pestilence, only to face forced repentance or scapegoated to be staked and burned. I think of those pious today on hearing the president cite a Chinese virus to stoke fear while trumpeting ignorance. The mobs attacked to absolve debts, embezzle lands, or appease gods. What fears, I wonder, will my grandchildren understand me to be quelling when I demand they wash their hands? Yeah. So uh, yeah. I, I, I like I like how you bring that yeah. back to the present with a little little bit of a slightly lighter touch with the grandchildren because you know, uh, you know it's um there's there's nothing that's happening in a sense this gives me hope there's nothing that ha that's happening today you know um that has not had precedence in the past or that we have not survived as a people right you know so um uh, i'm gonna read one more um uh virus poem if i can just to kind of 
change. And then, and then we'll switch back to memory more generally. Uh, uh, so just, so okay. th this is called Bless You. Oh, yeah. uh, and again, this is um, uh, goes back in my, this is more a family poem. This is a sonnet. So again, this book is written primarily in forms. Most of you know what a sonnet is, 14 line poems uh, and rhymes in a certain, um, a certain movement. Uh, the last two lines generally have a harder rhyme scheme. Uh, and this starts with an epigraph, which uh, says, since sneezing was the first sign of falling ill with the plague, Pope Gregory ordered prayer for divine intercession. And that, folks, is, in fact, why we say today, bless you, or gesundheit, when someone sneezes. It goes back to the plague. Um, when uh, when uh, Pope Gregory thought that we were getting rid of the devil uh, when we sneezed. Bless you. Gesundheit, great Anne Frieda calls out. Each sneeze, another occasion for my soul to abandon my body. I hurry my index finger under my nose horizontally, blocking both nostrils as tutored, so evil can't seize and inhale to fill the void. Denying the devil his due, Frida dubs it. She, who at 60 to my six, reflexively worries her brow, reaches toward a box of Kleenex, and spits over her shoulder. I mimic, patoo, patoo, patoo. Tonight, eight years older than she was at her death, and dining curbside to curtail the coronavirus, I hear two tables over, ah, 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 choo. And for the first time in years, measure the distance between superstition and truth. Around me, panic, as mid forkful, everyone freezes. May God keep us upwind from all airborne diseases. Right, that 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 uh, that final rhyme really really nails it. You can see why why that was a sonnet. So, how much of this book was actually written? How many of these poems, not by number, but just generally, were written during COVID? Well, I mean, COVID is still with us <laughs> for one thing. I mean, I mean, uh, um, still. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, when did COVID start? I, I mean, all these poems were written in the last six years. Um, so a good portion. Um, I, you know, contrary to uh, a lot of people think I'm overly prolific because I have my kids books coming out and my poetry. I've got a theater piece uh, coming out, um, but I actually don't write all that much. Um, and uh, but I also don't throw out a lot. I work something to death until it's done and then move on to the next. So um, I would say uh, certainly a good portion of these poems were done during uh, the COVID. So just to turn to another kind of memory, I think we talked about this a little bit. You have a poem called Unforgettable, which mm -hmm. is about your mother. Um, and you can read either that, or if you want to read that together with the poem, the Sweet Caroline poem, um, okay. Or just just unforgettable. It's up to you. But I thought both of those um, were a good way of getting at this this idea of capturing memory. Well, thank you. From a I'll start with Sweet Caroline because it's on my screen, and I will have to read. I'll have to get to the book for the other one. Um, and uh, the type in my own books is too small generally for me to read. <laughs> so I do large. So Sweet Caroline. So my mother. As I mentioned earlier, um, uh, who was a very, we were very close. We spoke all the time, regularly. Um, my mother was a, a very sharp woman, uh, sharp both in her mind and I would say maybe in her responses uh, sometimes. Uh, she, she did not have an easy life per se. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, uh, she was a lovely person and almost everything I am, I can contribute to her uh, vision of me. Uh, but 
the last few years, she died uh, a couple of years ago now. Um, and towards the end, uh, she became a totally different person. Uh, and it got me thinking, there's a section in this book, to, you know, that kind of follows her decline. I'm writing as it goes on. And uh, it got me really thinking about um, when we love someone, what we love about them or who we actually love. Uh, I loved my mother. I loved my mother when she was no longer my mother. So, you know, what was it in her that I loved? You know, in some ways, I think of an old Seinfeld joke who says, um, you root for a baseball team and then they trade all the players, you still root for that team. In a sense, we're rooting for the laundry. Um, you know, what is it in my mother um, that, um, that stayed with me to the end. So, uh, this poem takes place, uh, when she was in a memory care unit. I think I mentioned that, uh, if those who are listening are about my age range, you will probably remember Neil Diamond's, uh, song, Sweet Caroline. My mother's name was Caroline, uh, and, uh, that became the song that, they would uh, sing with her in the home at the end. So this is Sweet Caroline. From this distance, you could be shooing flies. But as I exit independent living to enter the memory care unit, I can see performing his nail diamond dip shake swivel, the resident accordionist. According to Wiesenthal, Evil flourishes when the good do nothing. And the evidence is everywhere. Yet from here, watching you dance to the wheeze and bellow, a choir of cafeteria aides praising your name with every chorus, I think of the arrays of the brain, our synapses endlessly reinventing us. Dementia is lessened by music therapy, the director mentions, which has the potential to ameliorate your mother's depression. And so I watch you sway and clap. Your expression, unrecognizable, is, dare I say the word, sweet. Oh, Caroline, may you who prized vinegar above honey resigned to life's bitter truths, a husband's murder, an indifferent God. Now, finally, sing. Good times never seemed so good. Mm. I, one of the things you do in, in this poem, which um, I really like, which seems to sort of echo the theme again, is you've got a lot of internal rhymes here. The, the dementia and he mentions and the, you know, the, the Wiesenthal and then, you know, Wies and Bello. There's a lot of um, sort of unexpected interaction going on there with the sounds that's sort of beyond meaning, which I guess is part of what you're you're experiencing as your mother. Wordplay is, is what I love. You know, um, uh, the great poet Richard Wilbur, who I'm happy to say was a friend of mine, um, used to say that um, once you're, if you're not, we all come to words in the beginning through it, fun. I mean, this is how we learn language. Uh, it's great. You know, we make up words. Um, language is growing all the time. I have a children's book about Elias Ben Yehuda, who, of course, reinvented Hebrew uh, after, you know, 2,000 years. Uh, and how to make up words for everything that had happened in the last 2,000 years that were not in Hebrew previously, you know, ice creams, library, et cetera. Um, and uh, naming the animals, can you imagine how difficult that was? There are a lot of animals. But we start out as children loving wordplay, loving rhymes, loving that. Uh, and... Uh, uh, Richard Wilby used to say that if you're not having fun writing the poem, no matter what the subject matter is, then the poem won't come to life. 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, and for me, that is something that is very important to me, the music in the poem, the wordplay, how it all comes together. Uh, and, uh, and the subject is, comes along with that. And the other interesting thing about that poem, I mean, among the various things we could talk about is the Wiesenthal sneaks in there. You're talking about Simon Wiesenthal, who wrote the, the book, The Sunflower, which is a, a, a classic meditation on forgiveness. Yes. Um, and I wonder if you want to talk about that. I mean, that he's, he's all through your work. Do you want to say something about, uh, about that? Um, sure. Well, I, um, you can go online and Google me and I have a poem called uh, Forgiveness, uh, which tends to uh, end up on various sites every uh, Yom Kippur. Um, and, um, uh, you know, there there are a few personages that always come through my work. Uh, you've read the book, so, you know, Kafka pops his head into almost every other one of my poems. Um, and it's hard for me to actually read three or four poems without Kafka coming in. Um, Rembrandt shows up quite frequently, as does Edward Monk. Uh, Wiesenthal, that book uh, on forgiveness had a um, was a, an important book to me uh, because I'm not necessarily a forgiving person. Um, my wife, who uh, who when I married um, was Methodist, is well uh, was Methodist. Uh, she converted to Judaism and she actually went into labor while in the mikvah, but that's her story to tell. Uh, um, so, uh, okay, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had me and three male rabbis uh, standing around, and the female uh, mikvah attendant took one look and said, Are you all Meshuggan? This woman's in labor. Um, and uh, she gave birth soon after. Um, and she is now an interfaith minister. Uh, forgiveness is very important to my wife. Uh, it's how she came to religion and grew up. She uh, is much more religious than I am. I am very culturally Jewish and I'm wrestling with God. Um, but that is um, what's more Jewish than that? Nothing. Um, and um, and when we married, her worldview was very different than mine. Uh, and so, um, you know, how, how can we, the poem Forgiveness, which I don't have here or I would read, it's also a little long to read. It's in my last book, I believe, maybe two books ago, um, really wrestles with that question. Um, we'll, we'll put you know, a link in, by the way, for those listening, we will put a link in. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, it's either More Money Than God was my last book or battles and lullabies one of those two uh, i can look it up um but you can also see it online um on the image magazine site image art faith mystery is a magazine um a journal that's quite wonderful um and uh and i wrestle with that uh you know if someone uh, uh ex a nazi uh asks forgiveness for what they did uh, how do you go with that? There are no answers. At least I have no answers. Uh, but it's n- uh, still something that's worth thinking about. Uh, and when I th- need to think about something, uh, I think about it in poetry. That's just how my mind works. I uh, I usually don't know what I think until I start writing it down. And then when the poem is done, I kind of have a general idea what I think. But if I'm arguing with somebody one on one, I have a much harder time um, because I think through my pen or now through my keyboard, I guess. Right. right. Just for for um, I'm sure most of the people on this are familiar with the story about Wiesenthal and the sunflower. But the 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 story is that as a I think he was working as an orderly or something in one of the camps and he was called into the room of a dying Nazi commander who wanted a, a Jew to come to his bedside because he wanted forgiveness. And Wiesenthal famously uh, turned and left the room and said it wasn't for him to forgive what this guy or the Nazis had done. That was only for the dead, so it wasn't available. Right. And then there's a there's a book of, of uh, responses to this, and it's true yes. that there's a tremendous difference in the responses of Christian versus Jewish theologians. And I guess I mean, you were alluding to that. But, right. uh, yeah, so Wiesenthal actually, I mean, it's his book, he edited it. Uh, and he reached out to theologians all across the spectrum, 
uh, and, and, and said, this is what I did, what would you have done? Uh, and it's fascinating reading. So, so um, I was thinking of asking if you'd read Unforgettable, um, but if you can't get to it, we can do something else. Um, um, it's on page 42 of your book. Um, let me see if I can turn here and find it. And, and the reason, I, the reason I'm, I wanted to do that is because it's kind of a segue into the next and possibly, depending on the timing, the last thing we'll get to talk about, which is how you write these poems of religion, which sort of almost mm -hmm. approach liturgy. Um, okay, so I have the book in front of me. Uh, okay. I can't see me on my screen. Uh, I'll hold it up. Maybe you all can see it. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, and then we'll talk about the title also. Right, please. and this is uh, this is unforgettable. And uh, let me see if I can read the type here. I think of you every moment. I say at my mother's unveiling, before setting stones on her stone and kneeling in the dirt. Behind me, my sister and two cousins murmur assent. To our left, waiting patiently, my father, his 45th year underground. I cannot now recall that first hour I thought of neither. Perhaps I was nursing a flu, head cloudy with Sudafed, body fatigue and fever. Or maybe that morning when, Surprised by my lover, we feigned illness, indulging a matinee, and muting my phone, I saw my feed fetting a celebrity I hadn't known was still alive. By then, of course, they weren't, having overdosed the day before. But still, it made me cover my ears to better hear their unforgettable one hit heartthrob song I'd. I'd hummed since 16. Thingamabob is what you christened everything that first chilly December, you forgot my father's name and then my father. So yeah, memory is, uh, is difficult. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of the audience is, is dealing with this in their own life. Um, when uh, uh, a loved one can no longer remember names and then can no longer remember you. Right. And it, 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 I, I, for so, the, I wanted to hear that one because it pulls so many of the themes together that we've been talking about, including that thing you raised about how, you know, a person maybe dwindles what we think of as that person dwindles, but it's still it's still them and memory persists and you're still there at the unveiling and your father, you know, 45 years gone, it's still there underground. It's, I love how you bring him in as if well, he's- Thank you. I, I haven't read that in one of my readings it probably showed, but it's always nice to get a chance to uh, read around in the book a little bit. Oh, okay, sorry. Thank I didn't you so know much. That. No, no, it's, it's wonderful. Okay. I appreciate um, it. Um, okay, so that actually does bring me to another, another big question and- mm -hmm. um, a lot of another of your big subjects is religion per se, and as you say, you you say you struggle with religion, you struggle with with belief, um, and with ritual. But you have a um, this book actually contains a cycle of poems toward the end in under this fabulous um, title, "Turtle of Slow Devotion," which we'll come back to, which is kind of a kind of like a haggadah. It's sort of as if you could almost use it. Um, in in a as a cycle of, of poems in the Haggadah, do you want to um do you want to talk about that a little bit? I was I was going to suggest you read the first one, Passover prayer with house pets, but you can pick a different one if you'd rather. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so um, I've always argued with the Haggadah in my mind as it's being read. Um, there are things that uh, don't make sense to me. Other things. Uh, that do, uh, and uh, and so I decided to argue on paper. Uh, I don't recall how that started, frankly, or or why um, I did that. But then once you do one or two poems about the Haggadah, it's hard to stop. Uh, you know, I just things that I think about. Uh, 
knowing myself, uh, had I been following Moses when he came to the Red Sea, would I have taken that leap of faith? Um, you know, and uh, who was a nation, nation who was the first one in uh, and expected the waters to part? Uh, no, <laughs> um, I tend to be cynical and skeptical about things like that. Uh, so uh, when I look at our tradition of things that are happening, I want to argue with it. Um, I want to argue with the wanton violence that, you know, is all throughout the Haggadah. Um, and uh, the, um, you know, I mean, we do leaven it somewhat. Uh, you know, we drip, you know, the little drips of uh, uh, supposed blood, you know, and we mourn our enemy, you know, we mourn for their loss of life. But in general, it's a fairly joyous um, escape. And of course, how could it not be? Um, but uh, but there's also a lot in it that I think I might have been blind to, um, you know, that uh, that I would not have accepted. I think I have a couple of poems in that um, where I talk about my own blindness. Um, they're short poems. So let me let me read. I can start with the first one, which is kind of the the um, the entry into it. And then I try to go through each step of the Haggadah a little bit more. So uh, there's also a lot of prayers in uh, in this book. Um, and I surprised myself, frankly, by how many prayers there were. Uh, this is so Turtle of Slow Devotion is a longer poem. Uh, there are various sections. This is kind of the uh, opening bit, and it's called Passover Prayer with House Pets. Belief is the cat scratching at the back screen door, wanting in, wanting out, sipping from the goblet of wine we left for Elijah too near the water bowl. Faith is the stray dog rescued, his slobbering tongue both trial and proof. Each day he waits dutifully, confident of your return. Trust is the parakeet kept caged and covered inside our faintly beating hearts. O oh, turtle of slow devotion, gerbil of circular reasoning, let patience be our exercise wheel, and this prayer, the bathwater, steadily rising, until even the goldfish of my misgivings swim past window sash and doorpost, the house overflowing with chaos, with awe. I love that. Love the gerbil of circular story. reasoning. <laughs> Uh, running on the wheel while the turtle of slow devotion is sort of crossing the, I don't know, crossing the living room. That's, that's really. So, so, so this is my, um, this is uh, my poem for Abraham Joshua Heschel, uh, whose writings um, uh, are very, oh, it's, we just got a nice downpour here, probably where you are too. Um, whose, uh, whose writings are, are important to me. Uh, in the sense of uh, he really, he's, tr he's trying to teach us to look at the world with awe every day. Uh, I wrote a children's book about Abraham Joshua Heschel called As Good as Anybody, Martin Luther King and Abraham Joshua Heschel's Amazing March Toward Freedom. Um, and, uh, and he has been important to me ever since. Uh, I don't, uh, and in fact, I believe uh, you can go on Moments website, uh, and I had a nice conversation with his daughter Susanna Heschel. Uh, I don't know, two or three years ago, maybe Suzanne, when she comes back on, could put that link or tell us. Um, and we talked about her dad. Uh, he's somebody who I wish I had his faith. Um, I also wish I had his ability to. Um, to look at the world the way he did. And I don't. But I find that if I read him, I get little glimpses. And maybe that's the best I can do. But uh, but it's maybe and maybe that's enough. That's that's where the turtle of slow devotion comes from. Yeah, you know, it's uh, I'm certainly 
um, little by little, my wife will tell you that when we married, um, I refused to have a rabbi uh, even present. Um, her parents were not upset that she was marrying outside of religion. Uh, they were just upset that we did not have anybody there who had a direct line to God. Uh, you know, uh, 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 and no preacher was there. Uh, I come from a family. My mother was an avowed atheist. Uh, as you, you, you've read the book, so you know I talk about that a lot in the book as well. Um, and, you know, her worldview permeates my worldview uh, very much. Uh, my wife has a different opinion. Uh, and some of the people who, you know, have been important to me in my life, uh, again, Moment Magazine, I think I might have done something with Leonard Nimoy, who is my dear friend, and I've written a book about him as well, a children's book. Uh, used to talk, he had great sense of uh, spirituality and faith. Uh, the writer Julius Lester, uh, when my wife converted, she was in a uh, study group of two, the other being Julius Lester, who I at the time only knew as an angry black militant. Um, and uh, he yeah, was that too. Convert. Yeah. Uh, if you read his book, Love Song, Becoming a Jew, that is, to my mind, the best book I have ever read on identity, whether you're Jewish or not. Uh, I encourage everyone to pick that up. But, um, you know, so if these people I respect little by little, slow devotion, um, and yet I can't get away from that circular reasoning. Um, I'm just running that track and I keep, you know, I keep spinning my wheels. And that's what this series of poems is really about. It's prayers from someone who's trying to learn how to pray. Huh. That's, and I think that's, that's another, also a way in. I mean, uh, I, I, this, this book's very um, accessible in a lot of ways at a lot of points. And I would say that's certainly one of them. Um, Thank you. Rich, I think um, I could ask you many, right. many more questions, which I won't have time for. I was hoping right. we could talk a little bit about- We don't, we don't have three hours? Okay. Yeah, yeah, you know, we could just go on. Yeah. Um, well, you'll, you'll come to my porch anyways, and you and I will we'll get to talk afterwards. Right, um, and we'll, we'll put a lot of links into uh -huh. the uh, chat for this conversation for those listening to follow up on the things we've touched on. Um, I know that you'd like to finish by reading one the, the meditation after casting my sins upon the waters, which is let's, the let's second to last poem in this book. Um, okay. I would ask you just one question before uh -huh. that. Um, uh -huh. To wrap up, can you explain or not explain? That's not a good word for a poet, but can you say something about the title, Sleeping as Fast as I Can? Um, yes, well, this is an audience where I probably don't have to explain as much as I usually do. Um, but it is uh, probably many of uh, the people listening in know the old Yiddish folk saying, sleep faster, we need the pillows. Um, and to me, that is a beautiful construct of language. Uh, you know, it, um, it incorporates everything language can do. Uh, it's, um, it's very understandable. It's very straightforward. Um, but when you think about it, it doesn't, you know, it's, it makes not a very logical type of sense. Um, and, uh, and this book, that phrase comes up, I think, in this book in a couple of places uh, where I'm talking about my family or uh, Yiddishisms or language itself. And it's also one of the epigraphs of the book. It is. A, yes, I have that as yeah. an epigraph. It gives you, gives you a signpost as to what's coming. Yes, and thank you to Greg Wolf, my editor, um, who is uh, not Jewish uh, and uh, on this book and insisted I put it as an epigraph for the non-Jews. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, just in case you, you needed, you'd have missed it. Um, great. Okay, well, let's hear the meditation after casting my sins on the waters, which, again, it's a sonnet, right? This is a sonnet, uh, and, uh, and I think it's appropriate really for uh, this time of year. We're entering the uh, September holiday season uh, when uh, we uh, sometimes do uh, go to that body of water to cast our sins upon it. Um, meditation after casting my sins upon the waters. As if God had kicked the crutch of belief out 
from under the limbs of the wounded. As if our souls were unwanted weekend guests in the summer beach house of the body. As if I were still the magician's prepubescent assistant, waving my skinny arm and wand. I will create as I speak, the Lord once saith, in Aramaic no less, avra kadabra, distracting us with cape and hat and that sly cunning grin. Oh, how I envied his deep voice and gift for misdirection. And now my astonishment at this morning's small miracle when up early and stumbling at the shore, I saw as I fell face down into the shallows, my sins swimming about me like a school of minnows. No, I mean like my own fingers, all 10 of them intertwining into a gesture of prayer. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rich Michelson, for this wonderful conversation. Um, could talk for hours about this book. I hope everyone uh, has a look at it. Um, also, some of your other books, which have also wonderful titles, including the one called More Money Than God, uh, which is the last book. But um, thank you so much for being with us. And um, thank you, yeah. Amy. It was a pleasure. And I and love more. Everyone. Um, so it's a special pleasure to be speaking on their platform. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for the plug for a moment. And thanks everybody for, um, for being with us today. Yes, thank you both, Rich and Amy. We really appreciate it. What a wonderful conversation. Uh, we would like to invite those who have any additional questions for Rich to send them to Moment Live at momentmag.com. And we will post the questions and Rich's responses on our website along with today's program. Again, Rich's book is uh, the, his latest book of poetry is Sleeping as Fast as I Can. Again, Rich and Amy, thank you so much. And we will see everybody next time. Thanks. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Amy. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for tuning in.